Let's talk through Xenos monstrosities great and small, with an overview of every data sheet in Codex Tyranids, and roughly how powerful they're looking in Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Tyranids, and in this video I thought we'd go through the entire Codex, talking through every single unit, and how they seem to be getting on with the new rules and points. At time of recording, it hasn't really been too very long since Codex Tyranids dropped, with a lot of detachments and options and things. It definitely feels like the Codex is in a bit of an experimentation period. It does seem that people are having at least some fair success with multiple different detachments though, and while it's certainly not stomping tournaments left, right and centre, there's still some high performing lists, and it might overall be a good thing to try and escape retaliatory Games Workshop nerfs. In this video I thought we'd go through each and every unit in the Codex, and talk through briefly roughly where I'd rank them in terms of in-game power, and how much value for the Swarm they bring to the Tyranid army. Obviously tier lists in Warhammer 40k are a bit arbitrary, depending on your own army list and tactics, you could definitely bump some units up or down a tier, and perhaps even more so now that there's different detachments out there. Some of these units are absolutely more relevant in certain detachments than others, this one's maybe supposed to be a bit of a general overview, but it kind of makes sense that things like Hormagorns are going to be far better in an unending swarm, or various monsters are going to be the things to go for in Crusher Stampedes, otherwise why would you play the formation? In any case though, for a focus on raw datasheet power, for this one I've chosen to rank the Tyranids units into four different tiers, this list broadly based on previously established good stuff from the Codex, how the points and things have changed for them since then, and also with a bit of a nod to the first high placing Tyranids list that already seemed to be doing okay. Without further ado, let's jump straight into it, start with the weakest stuff and make our way towards the strongest. First up, here we have some of the units that just really haven't had things go their way, and seem to remain similarly underpowered post-codex compared with pre-codex. First up, the Harpy and the Hive Crone are 215 and 200 points respectively. They just seem very badly balanced compared with their peer monsters, they're not particularly tough for the cost, and not particularly dangerous, and while of course they do have some pretty massive speed, I don't think it quite makes up for the deficiencies in the first two. It was kind of weird that Games Workshop stopped more than one Harpy from spawning in Spore Mines each turn. That definitely didn't seem to be something that was causing any sort of problems, and didn't really have the weirdness going on with Biovores. Despite their shortcomings, I still probably rate them above the other units in this tier though. Next up, and still remaining weirdly overcosted to the extent that you never really want them in your army unless they were spawned in, are the Spore Mines and the Mucolid Spore. 50 points or 55 points, and basically just enormously fragile little mines fairly likely to die to the first burst of anti-infantry firepower for 50 points worth of models, and even if they do reach the enemy and blow up, then often they're going to do less damage than the points they cost in the first place, even if you get them in close. Still seems that Games Workshop wants to keep these as a unit that you want to spawn in and not to actually buy in with points, though two of the spawner type units, the Harpy and the Spore Assist, also seem to be rated down in this tier, though admittedly the Biovore is very good and near auto-include status, though we'll get on to him later. Talking of spawning Mucleids, next up there's the Spore Assist, 145 points for an immobile fortification for the Tyranids that's really quite low defence. It was pretty bad for the cost before the Codex I thought, but since the update it just got hilariously so. It did gain a few shots on its Hive Defences type weapons, but can no longer just overwatch with them essentially four times in the enemy turn, it's only once. And without particularly good damage defence or utility, you're probably better off bringing just about anything else. Finally, and also ranked down here for its impracticality, is the Hierophant Biotitan at 810 points. Forge World's enormous Red End Spider thing definitely can bring some heavy firepower with those Dire Bio Cannons, but just overall not really enough for this amount of sheer points cost. You can get an awful lot of other very efficient Tyranid monstrous creatures for 810 points, and he's never really going to outweigh that kind of utility. It also has the disadvantage of being very hard to move around the map from its absolutely enormous profile. If you're playing on any sort of table with at least reasonably dense terrain, there's going to be a massive amount of places that it just can't go. Moving onwards and upwards though, in tier 3 I'd rank these as kind of overshadowed data sheets within Codex Tyranids, perhaps having some niche uses and applications, but I wouldn't generally expect them to be fielded in big numbers in competitive lists. Starting out, we've got a couple of the units that I might have been a bit more tempted to put up in tier 2. I think the Turvagon does remain at least fairly interesting at 190 points. It's not really that expensive for its fairly meaty defensive profile, and it respawns you some Termagants and gives them lethal hits. Definitely some very solid support for a Horde army if you want one. 
It doesn't really have a whole load of personal threat with its shooting and its kind of inaccurate melee attacks, and it can be shot directly, which could make it a little bit of a liability in a dedicated horde type list. If you've got loads of little bodies and then just a couple of turvagons, these guys are going to be magnets for just about every anti-tank firepower gun on the board. I still probably rate it towards the upper end of this tier though. Lethal hits is definitely nice for the termagants to actually make them a bit more threatening, and whenever it gets to respawn those, that's some added value. Next up, and probably also on the upper end of tier 3, is the Psychophage for 125 points. These are the fun Psychic Tyranid Feeder Tick type bugs. Fairly tough for the cost with their Feel No Pain type saves, but really quite low damage, even against their intended prey now for enemy Psychers, ever since their devastating wounds only go on a 4+, plus, not on a 2. I say its best value is giving Feel No Pain to nearby Tyranids, which I think is kind of useful, and it's fairly likely that these guys might stick around until the later game as well to give it to the monsters for most of the game, given that they're likely to be on the low end of priority threats to take out. I certainly wouldn't go overboard with them, but maybe one to cover a whole bunch of other monsters with Feel No Pain seems okay, and I guess bonus points if it's Assimilation Swarm, where they have the Harvester keyword to heal some other units. Next up for 145 points, we've got the Morlock, a great big spiny burrower who gets a whole load of attacks that are damage 1, plus a fairly fun pop-up attack where he can deal some mortal wounds to enemy units that are particularly nearby his tunnel. Generally I feel that it suffers from being just not very take all commerce for 145 points. It'll be strong if you're playing against enemies with a whole load of one wound infantry, but if you're not then the Trigon's probably going to do you better, particularly with its big pop-up threat that it can combine with rapid ingress. Next up for 170 points we have the Screamer Killer, I think it's a model that really quite a lot of people want to use in game, really quite fun and destructive rules with no less than 10 attacks that kill terminators very well at strength 10 and damage 3, plus some psychic screaming to whistle down enemy hordes and potentially inflict some battle shock semi reliably with a minus 1 debuff, you could combine that with a Neuralictor to try and trigger a plus 1 to wound for the rest of your Tyranid army shooting. Unfortunately at the moment it's just very overcosted compared with the good monsters, I feel like likely around about the 135 to 150 mark would have been better balanced. As I talked about in a recent unit review for it, it does seem to get outcompeted very heavily by the Harrispex for a more dedicated melee bug, never mind all the other good monsters that you might choose to bring along. Next we've got the Tyranid Warriors with melee weapons, 85 points for 3 of them or 170 for 6. 6 attacks at strength 5, AP 2 and damage 1 isn't too bad, that is a profile that's going to be pretty dangerous both to lighter and medium infantry, and threaten heavier infantry like terminators a little bit too. Still though, I think they're pointed just a bit north of where they really need to be. 85 points for just 3 of them, it just isn't all that much for their defensive profile, they're not really all that hard to kill. And just for getting cheap synapse on the board, you can get that with the ranged warriors just for 70 points, I think they're broadly the better data sheet as the result, maybe could be interesting enough to combine with a winged prime though. They are an interesting squad where some synergies could work quite well on them, but I feel like they'd be a lot more tempting if they were pointed at the 70 points mark or so, similar to the ranged warriors. Next up, for 610 points we've got the Harridan. This one did go down a little bit in Games Workshop's points cost, and as a result I think it's a fair bit more interesting than the Hierophant as a big bug to layer things like stratagems on, and at least it's got the fast movements to be able to engage enemies with those bio cannons or get to melee where it needs to. I think at 610 points it's a lot more playable, though I still think it's going to remain super niche. Not many people have one of these in the first place, and it is quite all or nothing. Some armies will be able to down one perhaps disturbingly easily, and I feel like for the most part you're going to be better off with multiple smaller threat monsters on the board if you want to bring lots of Tyranid monstrous might. 480 points, we have the Toxocrine, which did get a reasonable points cut going out of the Codex and the Balanced Data Slate. It is 180 points now, which is better than the 200 I suppose, but still just suffers from being a monster that's only really good against infantry, and even then with the AP-1 there's some infantry types like Terminators that still it might not do all that much damage to. Again, like the Screamer Killer, it just compares kind of horribly with a bunch of the other monsters. Certainly could be a usable datasheet, but needs to cost significantly less than this if people are going to play it regularly. Perhaps one of the biggest losers out of the last points update was the Tyrannifex, 245 points up from 200. A bit of a perplexing nerf given that they kind of nerfed it with the Codex as well, changing its minus 1 damage to a single ignore a wound once per game. And overall I think it was just a kind of unpleasant change, as it was a pretty solid but maybe not super standout competitive monster. 
most typically seen wandering up the board with an acid spray to threaten some big overwatch, I feel like the rupture cannon was kind of usable if you just wanted some dedicated anti-tank. Overall I'd say that 245 points is just too much for it really to contend with the other good monsters though. Kinda makes me wonder if Games Workshop wanted to sell some non emissaries in a similar sort of weight class to this, and decided to make the Tyran effects temporarily less appealing as a result. Next up we've got the Tyrannocyte for 105 points. The Tyranid style drop pod is just a little bit too steeply costed at the moment still. I could feel like it could probably drop with around about 10 or 15 points and then it could be pretty interesting between the dual purpose of getting a unit to the front line really quite early in the game, plus also then just being a wandering annoyance threat with a little bit of firepower and still a bunch of monstrous wounds. I feel like it perhaps also suffers from not having a whole ton of units that just enormously need the alpha strike bonus. Perhaps if Tyranids had some very fragile but very hard hitting close range infantry or something then it might be a bit more tempting but that's just not really something that they have in the roster and it's not particularly great for delivering melee units either as they'd still have to look out making a 9 inch charge after they disembarked. Also getting points increases in the last update are the Barbed and Scythed Hyra Jewels. Again the Scythed Hyra Jewel, maybe like the Tyran effect, was a monster that was played at least fairly regularly competitively before. Kind of a similar sort of flame attack to the Tyran effects itself, but basically paying quite a big points premium to be genuinely quite threatening in melee on top of that. Again, following a points increase, I feel like these have become a lot more niche as a result. Still definitely not unplayable though, I prefer the scythed one to the barbed one overall, though both seem alright. Finally for tier 3, we've got the Tyranid Hive Guard at 110 points. Fairly big chunky stat lines with high toughness, but they just don't do too much damage. And again, it was a datasheet that had a slightly perplexing nerf going into the codex, going up slightly in cost despite no one really running them. I think their Impaler Cannon Barrage Fire is just a bit too low in damage to really be worth it, and the Shot Cannons, while they definitely aren't terrible in terms of anti-tank, just don't compare particularly well to the same sort of firepower that you can get on more mobile monsters. I'd say for the most part they're outcompeted by some combination of things like Exocrines, Maliceptors, or Zone Thropes, if you want some fairly meaty hits that can threaten enemy heavies. At their previous points cost, I think that they would have deserved to go down, not up, so they're even more niche than they were now, and I'd probably rate them towards the bottom of this tier, or upper tier 4. Moving upwards, next we have tier 2, units that I'd consider solidly usable units that could have a good place in competitive Tyranids list, though in general maybe a little bit more niche than a few of the absolute top tier options which are ranked in tier 1. Out of these there were really quite a lot of units actually that I was kind of on the fence about, several of them that I could have been tempted to put upwards towards tier 1 and I'll talk about them as we go along. First up I do feel like gargoyles are certainly on the upper end of tier 2, really quite fast moving high objective control with deep strike and move shoot move, lots to like for an objective scoring unit there. They're not really going to do all that much damage with their flesh borers that could chip a few wounds off some enemy infantry and if you wanted you could make them into a fairly cool skirmishing unit with the winged prime to actually give them a little bit of melee threat. Overall handy units to have around, I do quite like the move shoot move thing which can get them a lot more movement onto the board and they're quite nice in the vanguard onslaught as well where they gain a whole load of other stratagem options. Next up and another one of the borderline tier 1 choices is the Lictor, really quite cheap and murderous for 60 points, it's got some pretty good quality melee attacks hitting on a 2 plus with precision and fights first can make it a very risky thing to charge as well. It does also have the potential for a 0 CP rapid ingress as well which is pretty scary, that's a very reliable stratagem and could easily get you getting the first charge on the enemy rather than the other way around, a very powerful stratagem to get for free. Overall though, despite all this, I would rate it as just a little bit less valuable than the Neuralictor and Death Leaper, which will absolutely be competing with it for annoying lone operatives in the Tyranid army, though I still do think it's pretty great. In a similar sort of vein, Von Ryan's Leapers are 75 points or 150. You get three of these mini Lictors with the AP1 and Damage 1 attacks, really quite a flurry of attacks and quite a few wounds. They're a pretty good unit for clearing enemy battle line units and mid-board skirmishers, and again, like the Lictor gets fights first as well, very powerful with winning those little incidental fights, though in reality I think with damage 1 and AP 1, they're not going to be strong enough to take out enemy mainline threats most of the time. Again, I'd argue that they're perhaps higher up in tier 2, though again competing with Neuralictors and Death Leapers and things for forward deployment stuff. I feel like it's a niche that you probably want to go at least a fair bit into in Tyranids, though you do eventually start getting into diminishing returns versus more mainline damage dealers. Next up, for 95 points or 190 for 6, there's the Tyrant Guard, a bodyguard unit for a Hive Tyrant or a Swarm Lord. 
I felt like previously they were usable, but a lot of people just decided to run the Hive Tyrant without. Now perhaps might be a little bit more argument for them, now the Hive Tyrant is even more costly in points perhaps, to try and protect that investment. Otherwise not a bad add-on to the unit I think. They have a little bit of melee threat of their own, though it's nothing crazy. The main thing is definitely being pretty tough for the cost, and I feel like they do that job quite well for the points cost at the moment. Next up we've got the other Endless Multitudes type unit. Termagants, Hormagaunts and Neurogaunts, all of which I think are actually fairly well balanced in points and all do their own thing pretty well, and they're particularly useful in things like the Invasion Fleet where you can replenish multiple units of them for 1 CP, and of course the Unending Swarm which is particularly nice for the Hormagaunts with their rules for moving forward towards the enemy and all sorts of stratagems that support swarm tactics a bit better. Individually the Termagants are 60 points per 10, I feel like out of their loadouts the Spine Fists are probably overall the best. Two shots and re-rolling wounds, assault and firing combat are all pretty excellent things to have on a horde. I think they're quite nice in invasion fleets as well, particularly when they can get lethal hits against vehicles, and you can potentially use a Turvagon against them if you think you can protect it from getting focused down and shot. Hormagaunts are quite cheap now at 65 points, they went down a bit, Cheap, fast and annoying melee infantry. At strength 3 and AP 1, they're pretty good against light and medium infantry, though are going to struggle against things with 2 plus saves or very high toughness. These guys are pretty much the unit that you want in the unending swarm detachment with their moving closer when they get shot, potentially setting you up for charges very early in the game with their fast movement and their advance and charge thing. Finally, the Neurogaunts I definitely wouldn't underestimate at 45 points. The point of them isn't to do any damage whatsoever, they're very bad at that, but just for bringing gaunt wounds to the table has value all of its own. I feel like just literally for backfill board control you could do worse than bringing a unit or two of these along. They can screen out deep strike if necessary, just provide a whole load of annoying bodies to kill on objectives, and if the enemy does wind up spending any significant amount of time killing them then their job's probably done already as they're very cheap points per wounds. They could also bodyguard a Neuro Tyrant if you want to, they do have some slight trade-offs with making them toughness 3 until the last of the swarms are killed. It does mean that you could have the Neuro Tyrant take a bunch of wounds in an unlucky flurry of shots. Next up we've got the Barb Gaunts at 60 points, no longer anywhere near as crazy as they were on release when you could potentially have them fire at 5 different infantry units and slow them all down massively. I think they're in a, perhaps a bit of a better place now, probably a unit that you could maybe take one of as some nice counter infantry, and even at their slightly increased points cost at 60 points I think they're pretty much fine for that. Two wounds at toughness 4 with a 4 plus save isn't bad defence for 12 points each, and their mass blast weapons are really quite good for cheapish infantry. If you get to fire a unit of these into a 20 man squad or something you're going to be adding a crazy amount of extra shots. They can fulfil the role of dedicated anti-horde really quite well. I probably wouldn't go overboard on them, but a unit or two to have on the battle line seems pretty fine for killing enemy light to medium infantry, and potentially still having a whole load of value slowing down a big expensive heavy infantry type unit and keeping it out of the fight for a turn. Next up, for 70 points we have the Venomthropes, providing their aura of cover to nearby Tyranids, and then also stealth for non-monsters as well. Between those two debuffs, if you do think that you've got enough meaningful units to use them on, I think that's pretty great value for 70 points, plus you also have their small amount of threat that they bring themselves, some okay infantry killing melee. I'd probably only take the one unit of them to protect the single most important area of the battle line, but I do think they're pretty efficient for what they do for helping to counter enemy ranged armies, maybe could have been ones that might have been ranked up in tier 1 perhaps. Next up for some mainline damage dealers we've got the Carnifexes, 125 points each and really quite flexible in terms of what you want out of them. Generally I'd be most tempted to arm them with one ranged weapons, maybe a heavy venom cannon plus some combat things of your choice, and I think if I were including Carnifexes at least for the first squad of them I'd be very tempted to pair them with old one eye, which I think makes them significantly better given the full rerolls that they get. Their base hitting on 4 plus is just a bit sad I think. In reality the first kind of effects that would add to an army would be old one eye, I think he's just a bit more efficient than these full stop, but I feel like they're pretty usable as a guard for him. Next up we've got the close range burrowing threat that is the Trigon, 180 points for a unit that can pop up just outside of 3 inches of the enemy. That in itself can be sometimes quite helpful for getting into the enemy backfield and maybe doing things like certain secondary objectives but it can be a bit of a nightmare for the opponent if you combine it with rapid ingress, pretty much guarantees that you get to throw a trigon where your opponent doesn't want it. Ideally what would happen would be your opponent moves their army, then you use rapid ingress to bring in the trigon somewhere very close to a vulnerable unit, but somewhere where they can't deal anywhere near enough damage to kill it, perhaps behind some obscuring ruins or something. 
Then in the enemy turn you get to go to town on whatever its chosen prey was and hit them with a whole load of damage to attacks that are quite good at killing space marines in particular. I'm not sure if I'd be tempted enough to run more than one of them. Feels like they might have diminishing returns, but I feel like one Trigon added to an army with the plan to rapid ingress it seems like a pretty annoying threat to have to deal with and could be quite a powerful tool to kill something that otherwise would have been very safe. Next up, and perhaps one of the units that I'm most uncertain about ranking, is the new Norn Emissary and its assimilator counterpart. I feel like these big high investment bugs for around about 300 points are either going to get to the point where they're efficient enough to be taken in quite a lot of lists, or they're not. The balance could be kind of fine on units that are quite this high investment. The main thing that would draw me to them is their objective grabbing rule. I'd be more tempted to use that than the rerolls against one enemy target. If they stand on a midfield point, then they get a huge objective control 15 and a 5 plus fill no pain. A big swing towards winning the primary game and actually makes them very hard to take down for the cost as well. And between the two, that does seem like a big win. For the flavours of them, you've either got the big anti-armour damage that the assimilator can bring, is a lot better against heavy targets and vehicles, or perhaps the slightly more medium threat that the Norn Emissary brings, that one's a bit better against hordes with its psychic shooting where it can flex into an infantry killing attack. I'd be initially tempted to say that the Emissary might be the slightly better of the two, given the 4 plus invulnerable save and the mortal wound defence, though just enormous amounts of tank killing power definitely isn't nothing. Overall my guess would be that they're going to be quite usable but not auto include, though having one stand on a midfield point and hold it against all comers does seem very intimidating. Next up, Gene Stealers and the Broodlord both went down in points a bit with the points update. Gene Stealers are 85 points and the Broodlord is 90, though they did have a small rules nerf in that you can't re-roll the wound roll and fish for those devastating wounds anymore. Given the points changes though, I still think that they're okay. They scout quite quickly up the board and are still pretty murderous against most standard size enemy infantry. The Broodlord helps them to tangle with some bigger threats a bit and they still do get some pretty nasty re-rolls against enemy units on objectives, making them particularly good for killing them. Again, probably not a unit that I'd go too crazily heavy on, and could be better in the Vanguard Onslaught once more, where they're a kind of interesting unit to use a bunch of their stratagems with. Next up, for 65 points we've got the Winged Prime. I think 65 points is far more reflective of his actual combat abilities compared with the big 80 that he was before. He felt very underwhelming at that cost. Now I feel like perhaps his most interesting use is to help out Gargoyles being a bit more of a skirmish threat on the board, adding in a bunch of damage to attacks to help them maul some medium infantry in combat, plus makes their shooting a bit better and provides synapse as well. Not too bad for a squad that you want to be reliable on objectives. If you did want to build around warriors, then I feel like one of these at 65 points is now a lot more appealing for either flavour of them. The sustained hits starts to get efficient when you have 6 warriors, and he could be kind of helpful for getting units to charge a little bit easier. His big movement means he could range out the front a little bit, and then shorten the charge distance. He can also give the Warriors Vanguard Invader keyword if that's needed as well, only relevant in that one detachment of course. Talking of Warriors, I would still rate the Warriors with ranged weapons a little bit higher than the melee ones, mainly because it's just 70 points for a very small unit that can provide synapse. Unless I'm missing anything obvious, I think that's the cheapest synapse in the codex bar the winged prime, and while he's a lot more efficient than he was, I still don't think that he's a unit that you'd ideally want just running around on his own. Otherwise, besides the synapse, they're just an okay medium threat unit, not really going to be doing anything particularly outstanding, but chipping in a little bit at range with a venom cannon perhaps, and it's still going to be enough of a threat to scare lighter enemy infantry in combat. I would be most tempted to mainly just take them for synapse though, if you need some. Next up, there's the Parasite and Mortrex for 80 points. This guy's a fast-moving lone operative with the potential to spawn rippers if he can wound an enemy infantry with the barbed office positor. Quite a cool model and really quite fun to use in-game. He is pretty fast as well with those wings. I feel given the influx of new lictors though, he just doesn't really enormously compare amazingly with things like the Neuralictor, Death Leaper, or the regular Lictor. All of those can do lone operative things for decently less points, while generally either being a bit tougher per point and or dealing more melee damage as well. I feel like as a result he's probably not going to get played quite as much as the Lictors these days. Next up, for 270 points we have the Swarm Lord. He still does his gain a CP trick each turn and has his ruinous stratagem even though it's only applicable to battle tactics now. At the very least I guess he could still mess with the enemy command point reroll which could be very annoying for them. I did think that it was a bit surprising that he went up in points really, given that his battle tactic thing got nerfed a bit. In general he was considered pretty balanced before overall. 
Overall though, still playable I think, given the command points that he gets, plus having a fairly potent melee stat line. If you did want to build around him, I'd be tempted by some Tyrant Guards to keep him alive and on the board and generating those CP a bit longer. The strategy and manipulation thing still could be pretty devastating against some armies, though of course the targets are a bit more limited now. Next up for 210 points and going up a bit since the index is the Winged Hive Tyrant. Again, perhaps a little bit of an unfortunate nerf of toning down its free stratagem, limiting it only to battle tactics, while also going up in points at the same time. I think it makes him nicer for invasion fleet, where that battle tactic stratagem can be the feel no pain one, or the vanguard onslaught, where he's one of the biggest and baddest threats with the vanguard invader keyword. In general, I'd be most tempted to run him with the bone saber and lash whip, though he could take a big gun. And outside of rules like the Vanguard Onslaught, where he can potentially be hidden with a stratagem, he is maybe just a little bit disappointingly easy to kill for the points cost, and can't use Tyrant Guard to stay safe unlike the Foot Tyrant. Finally for the Tier 2 units, I've chosen to rank Ravagers here. 75 points for 3 of them, or 150 for 6. They're basically faster moving and slightly lightly armoured warrior equivalents, with some close range carapace weapons and a fair amount of stacked attacks with twin linked in melee. As per the codex, you now have to choose between the extra thorax shots or some slightly better armour, both of which I think are kind of okay, really. Again, probably not a unit that I go too heavily on, as they're pretty geared towards infantry killing, which doesn't usually tend to be the Tyranid's problem, but could be the right unit for some armies. Finally, getting on to Tier 1, here's where I'd rank the stronger of the Tyranid units, models that I think are going to be really quite common as competitive picks going forward. First up, we've got the new and snazzy Neuralictor for 65 points. Low operatives in 10th edition are just generally handy to have, annoying threats to get to grips with while they're trying to do primary objectives or secondary objectives, and the Neuralictor has the further advantage of just being unusually tough for that points cost as well, with 7 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save. With a few lucky invulnerables, he could tank a fairly spectacular amount of damage. His melee damage is definitely a bit weaker than standard Lictors, only having damage 1, not damage 2, but instead he gets a fairly random but genuinely quite powerful chance for a plus one to wound against certain enemy units. It'll apply to units within 12 inches of him if they fail Battleshock, which they could from Shadow in the Warp maybe, and potentially have some enemy units that are very easily to take apart by a Tyranid gunline or some melee threats. Between his big toughness, a little bit of damage, and a situational but powerful special rule, I think that these guys are going to be a staple going forward. Similarly, I feel like Death Leap has risen up even more with his snazzy new model. He was pretty good in the index version when he was just 80 points. Now in the codex, he's got the improvement of a 3 plus armor save, a 4 plus invulnerable save, which now the Lictors don't get, they don't get any, and still brings the same fight first with a whole load of high quality damage 2 attacks, plus some battle shock things. For 70 points, I think he's very hard to turn down for that kind of cost. Very nice to have infiltrating somewhere into the mid board and being a bit of a scary unit for a lot of enemies to approach. Next up for a few of the better monstrous damage dealers, the Maliceptor is 170 points. I feel like he's just an all-round quite good combination of a strong frontline bog. Some 18-inch shooting with a bunch of damage 3 attacks with psychic shooting is quite nice. A bit of okay melee threat with a strike and sweep mode, and fairly tough for the cost with his 4 plus invulnerable save, and also provides some synapse and melee debuffs as well. I feel like these things are at least fairly easy to use, and he could maybe advance and shoot them with a nearby hive tyrant as well. That could work quite well in concert with each other. Next up is the very cheap Harrispex at 125 points. If you just want an efficient and deadly melee monster on the board for a cheap cost, then this is the go-to. Pretty outlandish melee damage stats compared with most things in Warhammer 40k. 14 attacks at strength 7 and damage 2, followed up by another 4 attacks at strength 14 and damage d6 plus 1. It's good both against hordes and the very heaviest stuff in the game as well. I feel like somewhere between 1 and 3 of these is rarely going to be a bad choice. They're super cheap and that means that they're relatively tough for the cost as well, Although of course anti-tank weapons will go through them pretty easily, as you'd expect. And he does have a couple of other little advantages as well. A sniper tongue attack, a battleshock test in melee, and he does have the harvester keyword if you happen to be playing the assimilation swarm. Next up for 135 points we have the Exocrine. Really quite nice mid-strength, high AP and damage 3 shooting out of these guys. And again like the Harrow specs maybe a little bit cheaper than you might have expected for that kind of threat. They're very efficient at taking down enemy elite infantry like standard space marines and terminators and has a damage increase type special rule with one thing that it hits with its bioplasma to make the rest of the Tyranid gunline a bit more efficient against it. Again, hard to go too far wrong with as a big mainline damage dealer. The shooting is pretty general purpose. Next up, we've got the psychic shooting choir that is the Zonethropes. 
110 points for three of them or 220 for six, in general tending to be fielded in multiple units of three. Despite the points increases, these guys are very much still making their way into competitive lists, fairly easy to use with either some last cannon equivalent shots or some warp blast attacks that can hack through enemy elite infantry. Really quite flexible with their 24 inch range shooting and at least fairly durable having their 4 plus invulnerable saves. I feel like they're a particularly interesting choice in the Synaptic Nexus detachment as well where they get the focused rerolls. There's one stratagem that allows you to nominate one enemy unit and you get some rerolls to hit and wound against that target. Really quite good with their threat range in the first place. Next up, and I wouldn't be fooled by Rippers having basically no damage and not really all that much defence, they're still very good at 20 points for a single annoying base to pop up, and along with the Biovore, they're one of the two units that can make Tyranids just extra good at scoring secondary objectives compared with a lot of other armies. I'd probably take somewhere in the region of between 1 and 3 Ripper bases at 20 points each, put them in Deep Strike, and then have them pop up where you need to have secondary objectives scored, things like behind enemy lines, investigate signals, or things like cleanse maybe. It could also be quite good for screening enemy units as well and getting a bit more board control in that way. If you ever can have a Ripper Swarm block off a choke point between a ruin and stop a powerful enemy heavy hitter advancing, then that's probably going to be worth the 20 points. And with pretty small expendable bases like this, they could well be used for screening out enemy deep strike as well and just being minimal investment placeholders to hold the board for the nids. Next up, and paired with Rippers for secondary objective things, are the Biovores. They are 75 points now, so fairly expensive compared with what they used to be, but I'd still consider exactly one of them to be auto included in an army, or nearly so, firing out a single spore mine each turn to do those secondary objectives the same as the Rippers can, and if you gain first turn, then it could actually be kind of important to throw a spore mine onto a midfield objective, if the enemy needs to advance to get to that midfield objective, you can basically guarantee that you can stop them getting there, as spore mines prevent you advancing within a certain radius of them. I'd say at 75 points, their indirect damage fire isn't really particularly exciting, but having access to it just for some very niche situations could be good. Say, for example, if your forces manage to wipe out everything bar one enemy infantry unit that's holding a key objective, then having the Biovore there just to hopefully finish it off with a single shot, that could again be a route to scoring more victory points or denying your opponent some. Next up, and for the perhaps surprisingly cheap cost of 30 points, there's the Pyravore. Again, one of the cheapest units that the Tyranids can field, and surprisingly only 10 points more than Rippers. If you can just spare a little bit more to invest in your Chaff placeholder type units, then this guy might well be worth the upgrade. He's genuinely very tough for the cost, going up to a big 5 wounds with his 3 plus save now, and does actually have some threat at killing enemy infantry units with that big flame cannon. It potentially could be a unit to put in strategic reserve, again to do secondary objectives, and with the advantage over rippers that it can actually threaten a bit of damage on enemy units, plus potentially even threaten overwatch, and have some objective control to contest primaries if desperately needed. Again, not really going to be doing the mainline damage threat to things of the Tyranid army, but I feel like taking anywhere between 1 and 3 individual ones is probably not going to be a bad move. Next up, and back to monsters once more, I feel that old one eye is definitely still worth the include at 140 points. I would rate him as being a bit better than regular Carnifexes, really quite fearsome dedicated melee with a bunch of attacks hitting on better weapon skill and very high damage, and also being far tougher than your regular Carnifex per points with his 5 plus feel no pain and regeneration shenanigans. If you run in with Carnifexes, then you can give them some big rerolls and make that 4 plus to hit feel a lot less bad. Though I do think that he's efficient enough to be fielded both with or without a guard. You don't have to take Carnifex as long to justify him, I don't think. Next up, and perhaps just about despite the painful price hike, Hive Tyrants I think can still be worth it. 235 points is just a bit grim for his defensive profile though. It's a lot to ask for a 12 wound bog with a 4 plus invulnerable save. Still though, even with his free stratagems being locked to battle tactics, I feel like a fair few armies will still get some very good mileage out of it. It can still get you the 5 plus and feel no pain type 1 in invasion fleet, which I think is often going to be worth the price of include, so you could have two copies of that running around on the most valuable units to protect each turn. Otherwise, he has some personal threat with his own venom cannon and some powerful combat, and an aura of advance and shoot with onslaught is really quite nice for several Tyranid units that want to be moving up the board. Maybe Maliceptors in particular could be quite nice for that. It's not too bad on zone throw-ups either with their slightly shorter range. He is definitely on the pricey side though after the points increase. Certainly worth making sure that the opponent can't kill him too early, either via hiding him or helping out his toughness with durability upgrades. 
either buying him a Tyrant Guard Escort or one of the durability upgrades like minus one damage or feel no pain built in, though what you have access to does depend on which detachment you're running. Finally, and perhaps towards the lower end of tier one or upper tier two maybe, is the newer Tyrant. Maybe a little bit below a bunch of the things here, but overall I do quite like the unit. I basically see him as partly just buying you an extra minus one debuff on the shadow in the warp, which at a 2000 point game would often lead to around about an extra three or four units typically failing that, depending on the opponent's leadership and exactly how many units they have running around of course. Could make it much more disruptive, definitely handy to have on the field if you've got new elixirs about as well. I see that as making up a chunk of his points cost, maybe it's an ability that you might have typically paid something like 20 or 30 points for if it were an upgrade maybe. And then after Shadow in the Warp has been triggered, it basically leaves you with actually a fairly cheap and expendable monstrous creature, despite masquerading as a command bug. His Psychic Flamer is fairly efficient against the right targets, really quite nice in Overwatch as well if you park him somewhere to defend objectives. And he is pretty handy for giving slightly further flung units synaptic benefits with those neuroloids that he can dispatch to them. He pushes out the buff to 18 inch range. He does have the potential for leading some units like Neurogaunts or the Tyrant Guard. Though to be honest I'm just not really sure that he's really all that much worth protecting. His durability isn't really too bad for a 4 plus invulnerable save on a monstrous creature for that cheap. I'd definitely be tempted by one of these in the Synaptic Nexus detachment in any case. Getting him extra strength and AP on his Psychic Flamer for just 10 points. That seems borderline also include plus their liking for making enemies fail leadership with the deepest shadow. In any case though that just about brings us to the end of our look at the units of Codex Tyranids. Let me know what you think of them down in the comments below, and which ones would you rate to be some of the strongest and weakest in the game. Look forward to any other insights, and particularly if you think that I've rated anything either too high or too low here, is there anything that you'd change around? If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, or I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.